I used to went to school at a place called Wash U in St. Louis. I think yeah. we've talked about this. Yeah, my grandma went there. Yeah, I know. I remember yeah, we yeah, were yeah. friends when she went. And um, <laughs> uh, but you I went to, in the fifties. Yeah, but I went in the fifties. <laughs> When we would be servers, we would just come back at night and just play Beirut and get drunk on, you know, Coors Light or Natty Light. Because you you don't have the mental or physical capacity for anything else when you do that type of job. Absolutely not. When I worked at the ad agency, you know, it was the hoity-toityest job I've ever had in my life. We had rooftop (laughs) parties. It was sick. And but when we did that, it was like. I was, I was like, I have so much more energy than when I was a brief stuff. <laughs> like, yeah. I was like, this is so physically less demanding. I, I'm allowed to take a walk whenever I want to clear my head. I can't do that on the clock as a barista. Absolutely you know, And, and I, that, that job was stressful in other ways, like getting, you know, reprimanded for incorrect advertising. Or, you know, like it's, it's more stressful from a corporate, like, oh, I don't need, I can't mess up this budget. But yeah. it's so much less stressful in the, like, I can take a walk whenever I want. I can poop whenever I want. And, and anytime. If you work in an office, you if anything, their bathrooms are probably nicer than the home bathrooms. Um, They've got some elements that I like better than the home bathroom. But I, Mine I mean, was. I, I love pooping at work. It was, the, it was the most fun. But when I but I worked at a coffee shop, no, oh, that's a public restroom at that point. You can't poop at work. Um, But I want to talk about the tea that we're drinking today. The tea that we're drinking today is one of my favorite teas. It is called Nearly Nirvana. It is a bourbon blend white tea. Mm. Love that you said you liked green and white tea. Because yeah. a lot of people come on here and they just go, oh, I don't know. But you were like green and white is what you like. Yeah, I like the lighter end of the oxidation spectrum, Josh. Thank you. Oh, hey, big dog. Yeah. Uh, are, you, uh, are you a big tea drinker? I, I, I've worked at enough coffee shops that I've been trained on tea mm. enough times that enough has stuck. Oh, and I, like I, I enjoy it enough. Um, like if I'm making tea at home, that usually means I've had too much coffee and I know I shouldn't drink more coffee, but I'll drink tea and that and then I'll go to green tea because it's less caffeine. Yeah. And it's also a little bit healthier in general. And it, Sometimes you just want something warm. Well, what I, and yeah, and I love that, you know, we're, we're drinking uh, a white tea that I love because it also has a little bit of orange blossom in it. It's really yeah. quite nice. Yeah, it's very nice. Um, and it's not as high on the caffeine spectrum. Right. But I want to go back a little bit, or sorry, before I do that, I apologize for those steeping at home. Three minutes at about 180 um, is what you want to steep this at. Um, but I want to go back to... You had mentioned when you used to work in corporate was a phrase that you used when you yeah. used to work in corporate. And yeah. you and I, uh, you know, full transparency for the listeners, you and I, uh, yeah, every now and again, go grab coffee, which I love. Oh, OK. I was wondering what full transparency was going to lead to. Well, in that I, I, I never want we my, sometimes yeah, yeah, yeah. hang out. Well, yeah. Well, because I because sometimes I think like uh, our listeners are like, did does he know this person? And yeah. I'm like, yes, yeah, like Jared We're is a buddy of friends. mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but what you revealed to me once when we were, uh, how great would it be if I just share a big secret? Uh, what you revealed to me once is that you used to work in corporate yeah. and your goal was to get yourself to a point where you could leave and really make comedy, yeah. uh, a f- take a full swing at comedy, not okay. kind of a half and half. Yeah. My big thing that I think about, I, and I said this when you first told me that. Because you're a corporate boy I'm yourself. Corporate. Yes, yeah. I, still work, I still work in corporate because I have not yet found a way to, what pays for these microphones exactly at the end of the day i haven't found a way to make make comedy uh or generate a full revenue stream from comedy oh yeah how were you not terrified to quit a job that paid well that lets you use the bathroom when you wanted like any of that stuff yeah and just like go jump off the ledge and give it a run it's a different answers from when that happened in 2019 to now because i'm not you know a full-time comedian yeah. in, in in a true sense right i prefer pursue it as much as i can but i'm not making rent off of comedy but at the same time in 2019 i lived in a very cheap living situation so it was a lot easier to make that jump sure um i lived at that point in a house with 10 guys and five bedrooms i don't know if we've ever talked about that in our friendship but i, had, I don't think we did yeah i had fi- uh, five bedrooms it actually was technically a four bedroom house but we turned the kitchen into a bedroom that the one of the living rooms into a bedroom and then what's funny is you might be doing the math that's six bedrooms now jared yes but we kept one as a guest bedroom so I'd so have a kitchen than a guest bedroom i guess sorry not a kitchen like a like a dining room I, oh. I, yeah not a kitchen my bad a dining room so like where you would put a dining room table at a sliding door not a not a normal door sure and that's how you knew it was probably the dining room i grew up with a pocket door in my on my yeah. bedroom as a kid yeah. oh in your bedroom yeah not great. Oh, okay okay not great yeah so i was in that living situation 
that kept rent very cheap. Before I was um, a corporate boyo, I uh, worked at a coffee shop. And so I ended up going back to the coffee shop. Uh, do, are you well, I took a bit of a break because I did save up money, wanted to take as full of a swing as I could, went back to the coffee shop literally February of 2020, oy, oy. Um, and then everything, you know. And then I was on unemployment benefits for a few months, and I was like, this is better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, but are you in any comedy or part-time job now, or you were doing comedy at a full clip? No, I, I, well, yes and no. I, in those last three years, I have had other part-time jobs. Yeah. I have had other at times like full-time i would say more like gigs and sure. so right now i'm in a position of doing some freelance production work as well as Amazing. um trying to pursue comedy as well as looking for probably another part-time job but i am trying to avoid food industry if i can right now what the thing that i i um really admire in you is that um you have a very humble fearlessness about you because I, I am do not, not feel that way, and I'm very thankful that you said that. <laughs> I am not shy about the fact that I am risk averse, and I have a lot of self doubt. Okay. So people who listen to this podcast know that I don't, I don't shy away from that. I I want to pursue comedy full time. People who listen know that, um, and I also let my listeners know very candidly. I am scared to leave my job. I don't see what the revenue stream can be yet. I dream yeah. of it, but I don't see it yet. And until I see it, I'm very scared to take that leap and i remember after you and i had coffee and i left um, we're friends everybody yeah yeah i just want to be fully transparent like we're i'm looking at the barrel like we're we are friends um after we had coffee i walked away feeling very um empowered is the wrong word feeling very um aware that it's possible to take that risk and nothing, huh. nothing it, it, it's yeah. not the end of the world it is like you took that risk and it wasn't like all of a sudden like you know the 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 dream police come and they go sorry we're got to take you away right sorry that, slam the door in your face <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 that didn't happen and i remember walking away and i actually went on a long walk after we I had coffee the last that's, time that's really fun i didn't know that yeah well because that, that, that gives me a little giggles i well, like that it, because i thought a lot about it. i was like i was like you know what like jared is someone who is under no delusion that this is easy mm -mm. but said to himself let me okay. take a swing at this and like Mm, I like that. Thank and you, man. I started thinking like, I don't know that if I said to you, hey, I, I you know, I, I'm not ready for it. I don't know that you wouldn't sit there and go, why not? And I was like, oh, oh. Yeah. and I started like thinking about that. And then I like had a whole walk about it. Yeah. I think that so much of it also depends on, you know, how, how willing to live a cheap lifestyle and like what sure. level of that spectrum. I also know that a big part of my decision in that season of my life at the end of 2019, when I quit that corporate job was that I had moved to LA from Indiana. Mm. And I knew nobody out here, right? And comedy was always the goal. Yeah. So there became a feeling of um, this job was very much taking me away from the ability to even do the non-paying comedy gigs that I moved here for. <laughs> right, right. You know what I mean? Do and, those free shows that you yeah. pretty much pay for in gas. Right. I couldn't even do the bar shows because I was working too much. Yep. Not, not every week, but a lot of weeks. And I was like, I, this isn't what I moved here. If I just want to be a corporate guy, I could have done that in Indiana. I could have done that in Chicago, which still would have maybe had the city life near Indiana, but at least then I could have driven home to my parents every now and then the four hour drive. I could have seen my nieces and nephews. Mm. But I think I think about them a lot, my nieces and nephews a lot when I think about if I'm not really trying, then why am I living here? Mm. And I don't mean that to sound all Tony Robbins, because I feel like it can at sometimes when you get into like what motivates you and, and not that Tony Robbins is terrible, but like if I if I'm not going after it. Not that we don't take breaks, not that we don't rest, not that I don't go on vacation with my wife every now and then, but it's like, if I'm not really trying at this thing I moved out here for, I could have done that in Indiana, where it was cheaper to live, where I was around my family, where I get to spend time with my nieces and nephews. So I'm like, if I'm going to make that sacrifice, I don't want to just be a corporate slave. Mm. That was like a big part of my decision in that season of my life. That's now been, you know, almost four years ago, which is kind of wild to think about. Um, but with the pandemic and everything, but that was like a big part of that. And yeah, I think we became friends soon after that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I don't even remember where we met. I think it might've been San Diego. I don't we know. met, I think we met at a couple bar shows, but didn't really hit it off. But yeah, then that yeah. weekend in San Diego was the weekend that we were like, Oh, we should be friends. Yeah. We, also, we live super close to each other. For sure. That too. I agree with everything that you're saying. I think sometimes I I'm just like, I think about the balance, right? No matter whether or not you're doing comedy full time, you're still balancing a number of things. 
you know, and I've said this before on the podcast, but like watering the relationship plant, right? That's really important. Oh, yeah. And when you have, for me, right? So I have my day job, then I have comedy, then I have this podcast, yeah. then I have my relationship. Yeah. And then it's kind of like, okay, it's striking those balances. And I think it's sometimes tough for me in my current state of affairs to find that balance. And I'm curious for someone like you who comedy is not a straight line. No. So it's not for anybody. Unless no. You, unless you grew up on TV. That's like yeah. the only person where it can be a straight line. But going back to you, given that comedy. Oh, always come back to me. I like yeah, that. Yeah. 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 Right. Given that comedy isn't a straight line. Yeah. How hard is that then to be like, okay, well, I gave up my, my, my permanent, my cushy day job. I'm trying to pursue a line that is not straight. So any given day, and I don't want to speak for you, but I feel this way. Any given day I go, oh, did I do, en- did I do enough today? Oh, I've I, done I'm anxious about, if you ask my wife, that is almost always like part of our evening conversation is me having those thoughts, 100%. But then how do you balance all of that with the fact that like, okay, well, I also have a wife who I want to be able to, I, you know, we have a, even if it's just you and your wife, that still a constitutes a family. Yeah. So you want to support the family and do all that, plan for a future. Even if you're not having kids, plan for a future. Maybe you want to buy a house. Maybe you want to do this. Maybe you want to do that. How do you balance all that and not just go to bed at night being like, I am freaking out? Yeah, I, I am nervous. I yeah, I think there's a lot of answers to that. I do get very, very nervous about that. I'm mm. scared most days about that. Mm. I often am nervous I don't make enough money. You know, my wife is incredibly supportive of my comedy journey. She has a full-time job. Yeah. So on the weeks where I'm not making much or a freelance gig doesn't come in, it's not the end of the world because she still has steady income. There yep. is a, That is like a wonderful privilege. But at the end of the day, yeah, I, I am very nervous about that a lot. I think if she were to lose her job, it would be a totally different scenario. I, I would be... I don't know if I'd be back in the corporate world, but I'd be back into like, okay, I need full-time work as soon as possible. Yep. It's going to be 40 hours a week and have health insurance, right? And it's nice that I don't necessarily have to have that that version of stability right now. Um, but it's also interesting is before we got married and when I was living in that house with 10 guys, you know, and like when it was like way back in the day and when it was like this scrappy scenario, I was paying all my bills as a part-time barista because I was sharing a house with 10 people i came in was that what was that rent like a stick of gum and a high five that rent had to be low it was 550 that's insane and that includes utilities that's insane and we had a washer dryer josh in los angeles it was a house i mean so yeah unbelievable yeah it was in, it was in culver unbelievable yeah, a, good, was, a, a good a good neighbor hated us man the neighbor it still exists and there's still 10 people that live there it's existed for like seven eight years and it kind of rotates who lives there <laughs> is it a is it a comedian vibe no, um, I will tell you it is a Christian vibe. Okay. So I'm a Christian, and I'm not trying to be a Christian comedian, which we were talking about before we. Oh, we in. yeah, we'll get into that in a second. We can yeah, get into yeah. that, but I it's I kind of call it almost like a, it's a Christian young professional fraternity is pretty much what it was. And Interesting. And okay. That the age range was like 20 to like 35. Um, that I, high. Maybe, yeah, I think there were there were, there was at least a couple guys in their in their 30s in this, and um and a lot of those became best friends like. I was in some of their weddings. They've been in some of mine, you know, oh, no or some way. of them were in mine. Like we've all kind of, a lot of us have kept at least that iteration of the house. I don't actually even know any of the people who currently live there, even though it's theoretically just passed off like one person at a time. And then you it's, just, yeah, it's Theseus' a ship over there. It really is. Um, but there's an older Christian couple who actually like, um, you have to apply to live there and they look at your, your application and kind of like judge if you're a good fit for the vibe of the house and the purpose of the house which is meant to be for people who are new to LA. We, I mean, this is not meant to be a pitch for that house, but nope. it, it was a great place We haven't place named them, so they, don't, they get nothing for free. If they, you all want a sponsor, um, we'll inject the name right. here. Yeah, they, um, yeah so the, I lived there for about two years, which is the like what they tell you when you move in, of like in about two years, they're not going to kick you out, but we want you to start looking for a place so we can open this up for somebody else who might need it. Sure. And then at that point, I was way more plugged into LA and was able to live in another apartment after that. Okay. When you grew up, cause I know, I, I, you know, you haven't said this on the pod, but I, you know, you and I have talked about this. So I know that you, you grew up, you grew up in Indiana. Yeah. Um, and you know, you grew up somewhat religious. Yeah. I grew up, I grew up very evangelical. Okay. Yeah. When you came out here in pursuit of comedy, mm-hmm. was your evangelical background in your mind? Were you like, I want this to be a part of my identity as a comic or were you like, this is a part of me. Com- comedy is a part of me. Those things don't need to overlap. They influence, but they I wouldn't say they are a part of the same identity. Like okay. my I this is the a very nerdy part of me. I listen to a lot of like 
art philosophy podcast. I love, love art that. philosophy. I'm a nerd when it comes to that type of stuff. And there's a few like Christian art philosophy podcasts that I really okay. love. And um, but for me, coming out of an evangelical setting, a semi, I would say a semi fundamentalist Southern Baptist evangelicalism. I, I wish I could even sit here and fully understand what all that means. Which I, I am not that anymore. If that's not obvious, I don't identify as that. I don't identify as evangelical in any regard. Um, I'm very thankful that that upbringing introduced me to Jesus and I'm very, I love Jesus, but the overall uh, culture of that part of American Christianity is one that I'm trying to grow. I would even like grow out of like in a transformative way like oh i need to like almost like mature out of out of the mindset that that uh gave me and i love my parents they did their best but the church we were at was very um rigid i would say and so to put it lightly so when i came when i first realized i wanted to do something in the arts in yeah, college yeah. i was very very scared that i had no right one like like how does that glorify god how does how does being a comedian share the gospel? Those were the questions that I was scared of. Interesting. And I even had a girlfriend at the time whose dad asked me one time, like after maybe like two or three open mics, literally like, because I started in Indiana. I did open mics in Indiana. And I remember, and I was doing normal open mics, not Christian open mics by any means. I was doing club, bar open mics. And he was like, so do you share the gospel on stage? And I was like, no. But that was the world I was in. Even at that point, I thought that was kind of crazy. I mean, he's a he's a nice enough man, but it it's not like I was um I already knew that that was too far. Mm. But then, but that was like the general fluid of of my life was that question, right? And that's been a big thing for me to to not use too much of a buzzword, especially in the faith community, but to deconstruct that. And conservatives are very afraid of deconstruction right now because they're afraid it'll get rid of them. And honestly, it it kind of does because it's the unhealthy parts. And then I, and I've talked about this probably never on a podcast, but just like I had a, a recommendation given to me by a podcast of a little book, maybe 80 pages called Art Needs No Justification. And it's a Christian art philosophy book by a Dutch philosopher named Hans Ruckmacher. And it's essentially like a nice long essay on how beauty is good in and of itself, even from a Christian background. Hmm. And it totally opened the door for me to be like, oh, I don't have to be like at the end of every set, be like, do you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Which I wouldn't even say that phrase anyway, I think in my current understanding of, of who Jesus is and God and faith. But I was scared of that at the time. And so I started in college and um, I was doing open mics around Indiana, occasionally yeah. going up to Chicago. I went to Purdue, which is like halfway between Indianapolis and Chicago. So I'd go down to India or go up to Chicago and I'd be doing open mics. And those questions were, I was afraid of it at the time, but I think while I was still in college, it felt like I'm allowed to like experiment. But as soon as I graduated, I got so scared that like, I just remember thinking, nobody wants to be an accountant. Nobody wants to do these boring jobs. Maybe one person. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. But like, so who am I to say that I'm not going to do that? And I was so afraid of that question. And I think that, you know, the Midwest and conservative evangelicalism in general is incredibly stability focused for a 1K focused um, sure. comfort. And uh, that question of like, do you know where your next job is? Like that, or, or even just like my brother's an engineer and I love my brother, but he had a job as an engineer six months before he graduated college and me even at that point i was in at the advertising at purdue and the advertising school or not advertising school that makes it sound way cooler than it is the communication school but my my advertising degree and even then i was like i'm obviously not going to be the engineer getting a job six months before i graduate but at least maybe something right and then um you know there's a lot of, on that journey but so that, that was like a big part of my formative upbringing and so then when i came out here i'd already been doing comedy like three and a half years depending on when you say I started and um I already knew at that point that I don't want to be like a Christian comedian sure I have no desire I've only ever performed at like a church maybe twice um and now it's because there's like friends that I knew but not because I'm getting paid to do it <laughs> I mean the church um, circuit pays incredibly well right and that's why it exists and we were talking about this before we ran but like a bit I have Christian comedian friends and I say that not just comedians who are Christians like myself but legitimate church comedian friends. Sure. Right? And I respect them. I think that if I were to go to a church that paid multiple thousands for a comedian and I'm giving to that church, 
I'd be so pissed. I'd be so pissed. I'd be like, I thought I was giving for alms, for helping the poor, for like, you know, helping get rid sure. of medical debt for our members, for, you know, soup kitchens, whatever the, the actual like boots on the ground. What do we want our community to look like? That's what I think that money Improving should go to. the world. Yeah. yeah. Love, compassion, humility, service, mm, mm. the historic Christian virtues, even if we don't see that in our current American uh, Christian um you know scenario and i'm like what so i've always been of the mind if i would hate to go to a church that pays a comedian or anybody that much money i'm like i should just probably not solicit myself that way either even though i'm mostly clean i have a few jokes that i know would not work at a church i say the word testicle a couple times you know i'll I'll do the minor you know i wasn't gonna say anything but i'm very familiar you're very offended with my testicle joke i've always have been yeah and i and i don't look down on anybody who's not clean by any means i i think very funny it's just always been my own um, sensibility and don't really I don't really think I think of their jokes occasionally but I really just tell them to my wife and then we just kind of laugh about it and, <laughs> and I'm like that's between us yeah there's um there's a comic who was like I, I said I'm clean on stage he goes well that's how your brain works and I'm like no you're like no I'm censoring myself <laughs> yeah well it's not even about censoring or not it, it, it's for me it's like I don't want to memorize two sets of jokes one that's dirty right. versions and clean yeah. versions I'm trying to create the least amount of work for me. Yeah. And to me, being a clean comic does that. Um, yeah, you that's know, true. I can come up with dirty jokes all day long. Right. Um, I want to go back to something you said earlier, because I think it's interesting. When when, when he was like, uh, your ex's father was saying in a manner of speaking, and tell me if this is an unfair characterization, but was saying in a manner of speaking, how does being a comedian further, you know, the 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 word of God? Right. But my question back to that is, how does being an accountant do that? that? That is the correct question back to that. Yeah, it's absolutely. Not, it's not fair, I think, to yeah, are put... Yeah, like, I'll do your numbers if you know about Jesus. Like, that's yeah, not how that works. It's not fair to put more of a burden on a comedian. Like, yeah. just because your job involves a little more leeway to talk about what you want to talk about doesn't and necessarily... Just, I think it's just more people. Or like, okay, oh, you're talking okay. to, you know, a lot of people, you know, depending on your success, you're talking to, you know, a lot of people, so don't you want to tell them the best news you've ever heard or whatever. Right. And I'm like, I just don't think I don't, I mean, my faith journey could take many more podcasts, but like, I just don't see faith in that lens at really at all anymore. Yeah. So it's like, I, I think we're called to love, but not, I think we're called to love in a way that if somebody wants to join, we, we, we um, are overjoyed by that, but it's not a, like a love. So we can proselytize that. That's not love. Yeah, yeah, I you, and and I I know when we've talked about this a couple of times that we both love Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah, and yeah, one of my yeah. Favorite, he's very atheist and very anti-Christian. Sh- well, I I think one could be atheist and not anti-Christian. But he has some very well. He's probably anti-Christian in the way that I know some conservatives these days who accuse me of being anti-Christian, which is willingness to critique the American Church, which they, in their mind is so. I think you need to be willing to together. critique everything. Agreed. Um, but what I was going to say is he has a quote that I absolutely love which is a purpose of human life, no matter who is controlling it, is to love whoever is around to be loved. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, on my first date with Jess, who you know, on my first date with her, we religion came up, and I said, that's my religion. Mm-hmm. That's about as close to the encapsulation yeah, of my religion humanism. as possible. true humanism. Just loving people. Yeah. And I think that sometimes, and this is not a comment on religion, but actually a comment on older generations, Sure. Because I'm more dogmatic, more rigid, more gatekeeping. Yeah. Like your 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 ex's father, it, I would imagine, was probably a boomer. And this is not a judgment on boomers. Yeah. No, he, he's firmly. But but I do think the people in that generation look at our generation, whether it's millennial or Gen Z or whoever, looks at these generations and is essentially like, OK, well, why why are you doing this? Or like, what's to what end is that? And you, there, there's just I feel like there's a lot of pressure put on people, whether you're doing comedy or or anything that is non-traditional. Yeah. And it's kind of That's like, very true. If you're not going to fit the mold, because they culturally they haven't parsed out that they're also in a cultural understanding of what the norm is. Correct. And so they just associate that with their belief system. And they just say, well, the norm is therefore Christianity. It's like, no, that doesn't make any sense. No, you know. <sighs> or Christianity is therefore the norm. I mean, I, either way, really. I was 15 years old, and I remember I, I, I told my dad I wanted to be a rock star. As every 15-year-old, I think, probably has had that conversation. Um, but I yeah, was, yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe a little bit. You know, I was, I, I was a, a, a long-standing musician at the time, and I told him I was like, I want to be a rock star. My dad was like, well, I think you need to have a plan B. And I said, plan B is for people that can't achieve their plan A. I mean, 
Which, there's truth to that. Well, there is truth to that. <laughs> what a, what a shitty thing of a 15 year old to say to their parent. Very true. But I but I but I said that, and um and he goes, he's like, you need to set yourself up for for some kind of job that you can rely on, and I said. And I will tell you, this is my, one of my biggest regrets. And I've told my father this before he passed. Oh. I said to him, I don't need a plan B. I'll be more successful than you ever were. Okay. Are, now, you, are you? No. Oh, bummer. Absolutely not. <laughs> but I said that to him. And I remember years later, I'm telling you, I was 15. I think when I was 24, maybe, we were sitting down, uh, hanging out. It was just uh, the two of us. And I said, you know, I know that, oh, this is weird, but yeah, I've always regretted. And I told him that story. Mm. My dad was like, are you kidding? I was like, like, I never remembered that. No, no, he, he remembered. Uh, he, he, he goes, you've been holding on to that. And yeah. I said, yeah, it really bothered me. He's like, you've said much worse things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He goes, <laughs> he goes, as a parent, mm. you're like, that's bad. I want you to be more yeah, successful yeah, than yeah. me. That's good. If I'm doing my job, you will be better than me, smarter than me, more successful than me. Yeah. I want all those things for you. I didn't sit there going, what an asshole. I sat there going, I sure hope that he does. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's a good day. And I was like, wow, okay. Yeah. And so sometimes, you know, when you hear these stories of people, whether it's a parent, a family friend, a girlfriend's father, whoever, set, you know, putting these expectations on people, I'm always kind of like, why can't we put them, why can't we put a positive spin on that expectation and say, you know, hey, you want to do this? I hope you crush it. Yeah. And I hope that you get out there and I hope that you are you achieve your goals and you end up happier than I did because it means that as a generation we did something right that the generation after us lived happier and did better. Sure. Why don't we yeah. all want that? I think there's a flip side to that too where I remember after college especially feeling like um I was told for the whole, you know, senior year of college or whatever like I can't wait to see what you do. Yeah. And that put so much pressure. Sure. Where then I was a barista and I was like, they couldn't wait to see this. Like they, there's and no you made way. a mean macchiato. I mean, I, I got good, but, then, but then like, I just remember feeling like I remember telling at that stage in my life, like all of my friends who were still in college of like, you're going to feel like a failure as soon as you graduate, unless you're are the engineer and you just get the engineer job. But unless, if, unless you're in an ultra stable career, like engineering or accounting or something like that you're probably going to feel like you're not doing the thing you thought you were going to do that then you've told people you're going to do. And then now all of a sudden you realize like you can't do because you're 22 and you're stupid and you just realize like, Oh, I can't do any of this. Sure. Yeah. I've, I've thought about this. If I were to ever give like a, a college, you know, commencement speech, I think a university commencement speech, I think it would be something along the lines of like, stop trying to change the world and just try to change your community. And if that works, try to change the world. Mm. And like, because otherwise the pressure we put, it can be just so, I, I know so many people, and that's why there's so many people who go get graduate degrees that don't really need them. I don't think there's anything wrong with grad school, but so many people are like, oh, maybe I just didn't have enough school to go do the thing that I was supposed to do. <laughs> sure. And so they, they feel the weight of that pressure, and then they get out of school, and then they go back to school because they're like, I guess I just didn't learn enough. I guess I didn't do enough. And then they go back to school. I, did, I, I definitely don't think I learned enough, and I am A-okay with it. Yeah, but that's a, that's a maturity you've probably grown into. I don't want to take credit for what I don't deserve, but I, I also just, I, listen, I love school and I love education. I think it's wonderful. I also, I, you know, I was telling Elliot earlier today, like when I would sit in a lecture, even if I had 15 shots of espresso, literally on an IV in my arm, if I were in a lecture hall of a hundred people, on a, fall asleep. I would fall asleep. That's funny. Yeah. I love lectures. Oh like, my God. I go to them. I watch them. Do you really? Oh yeah. I have not like a ton, but yeah. How did you end up with a wife? I'm so sure. Sh- like, like you're like, She's I great. love watching lectures. I'm like, what? She's great. I mean, like I was listening on the way here to like a history podcast about Oppenheimer, just getting ready for the movie. Getting ready for the movie. But you weren't listening to episodes of Steep Conversations. In the I way was yesterday. Okay. okay. Um, and awesome. I, and I will That's say it. this is so much less funny. Than, <laughs> than any of the episodes I listen to. So I'm so sorry to your listeners. Uh, uh, well, so I was going to say this. So we're cutting the first half of this podcast. Um, <laughs> it's as good as done. Um, but I actually want to take us to our first segment. Are you ready for the Newly Friend game? I think so. I think okay. we're both um, sufficiently bummed about the state of American evangelicalism to I... go into this game. You know what, though? I've always known it. Um, so the Newly Friend game, it's like the Newlywed game, but we're friends. I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to write down your answer. I will write down mine. We will see if they match. So you're writing down what you think mine is? or I'm Correct. Writing, and then are we so, also going to do it for you? Yes, we are. Do I divide my whiteboard in half? No, because no, I can't a, you show. Have, you, can, you can erase. I see. There's a, Wow, technology. Yeah, I'm here for you. Okay. Um, so the question for you, uh, I, I can kind of go one of two directions here. 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna say that. Go one of two directions. Let's do both. Let's divide it up. Uh, the questions I was gonna ask. Number one, and again, don't answer. Don't say it out loud. Write it down. My question was gonna be either, what is your favorite thing about Indiana? Oh, okay. Or was going to be what is your favorite Kurt Vonnegut book? So oh, okay. you can pick, which are both essentially Indiana questions. You, oh, that's true. Um, Vonnegut, you, Vonnegut you, is our other than Michael Jackson, maybe David Letterman. <laughs> do you Vonnegut. want? Do you want one, the other, or both? Um, do either. Let's do both. You want to do both? I mean, I feel like at this point the audience is teased. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, yeah. Let's do both. So, favorite part of Indiana? Yeah, your favorite thing about Indiana? Yeah, sure. Okay, favorite thing about Indiana. And then favorite Gravonigate novel? Yeah. I got it. You ready to flip your board on three? I, it's so, my answer is really cheesy. One, two, three, split. Fall Leaves is your favorite thing about Indiana. I said the loyalty and spirit of Indiana because anytime oh, yeah, I meet someone too, from Indiana, huh? they're always like, hey. Yeah, I love Indiana. Um, and what? then I guess Breakfast of Champions for the book. You said Mother Night. Have you read Mother Night? I have read Mother yeah, Night. Yeah, I love Mother Night. Um, why? Why Mother Night? I, well, it was one of the first ones I read. Okay. I think, it I think me... it's one of his first novels, actually. I think is it's it on really? the early. I think it's on the earlier side, yeah. Because it, it does feel more. It, it has enough of the, um, the witty, the witticisms of the the tangents into a critique. Mm-hmm. But it also, I think, is one of his novels that has the most uh, accessible like mystery plot. Like mm-hmm. it's it's a it's one of his novels that feels like it strikes that balance for me, where I could actually like recommend it because mo- a lot of his books are so. L- literary that you're like would this person actually enjoy this but i feel like mother knight's yeah. plot keeps it moving forward enough that you get through the witticisms without being like uh, rolling your eyes if you don't already love him like, yeah like, even slaughterhouse five i'm like they're not really a plot you know what i mean like the, if you're yeah. looking for like a good story i'm not going to suggest most Vonnegut novels I think the challenge would like so, so i wrote on breakfast of champions that what's funny about breakfast of champions is the breakfast of champions has one of the hardest plots because at one point he's in a coffee shop writing a book about him in a coffee right. shop writing a book. The Kilgore Trout? Uh, yeah. That, uh, yeah. It is might that... have, Yes. Kilgore Trout was the, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Which is a character that appears yeah, in a lot of, a lot of books. A yeah, lot of yeah, Kurt Vonnegut yeah. books. But in this case, it it was, or no, it was Kurt Vonnegut. Oh, it was himself. character. Kilgore Trout was writing a book about Kurt Vonnegut writing a book oh, in a coffee oh, yeah, shop. Yeah, and I was yeah, like, yeah. this is just too much. Um, it's fun. If you're already in, you're you're just gonna be. Ooh, this is so much fun. But great. if you're not in, it can push you out. That's your, any auteur. I mean, obviously he's not a director, but anybody with that level of of genius, you're gonna attract people who like. Oh, I, I'll go all in. Um, let's do this for me. Same question. Same questions about Indiana. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if you get this, buddy. Let's see if you get these points. I, I don't no think idea. so. Okay. You ready? Flip your board on three. One, two, three. Uh, you said the Kurt Vonnegut Merle. I said 70 mile per hour so highway. A, so there's a beautiful four story Kurt Vonnegut Merle in downtown Indianapolis. I've not seen it. Now really I really good. want to. It's on Mass Ave. Um, you should go to it. Yeah. I love that. It's for Kurt Vonnegut um, pilgrims. I used to have to drive through, not have to, got to drive through Indiana. Yeah. Uh, for uh, going to, I used to watch school at a place called Wash U in St. Louis. I think yeah. we've talked about this. Yeah, my grandma went there. Yeah, I know. I remember. Yeah, we yeah, were yeah. friends when she went. And, um, <laughs> uh, but you I went used to, in the 50s. <laughs> yeah, I went in the 50s. And uh, I used to go and I would drive in Indiana. And when, as soon as you hit Indiana, the speed limit went up to 70 miles per hour. And my thought there, and I'm sure this is giving up them, from 65? 60 to 65. In, a, in Illinois? Uh, yeah, in Illinois, I, I believe. And and my thought was, and this is probably giving it too much credit, which is fine, but I was like, Indiana knows that you're going to drive a little faster. We're on the highway, and Indiana respects it, and they say, do your thing. Yeah, and it, yeah. It, and I and I, so I always love that about Indiana. I will say, if I were driving there at night, the cornfield scared the crap out of me driving Yeah, they get night. creepy. They get creepy at, at night. I love. I have so many fond memories of driving, driving through the cornfields. My mom grew up in a really small town okay. in, like, in the middle of nowhere it has like seventy five thousand people but so we'll, we'd often do that like two hour drive yeah and that is just it puts me in such a child place of childhood well the, i yeah i just was thinking someone's gonna come totally out the totally and kill me um the book i chose for Kurt Vonnegut was cat's cradle yeah uh phenomenal yeah. I, yeah. it was tough it was tough for me i was have all you, over the board i mean without a country i mean without a country haven't read it no or is it with no country shoot did i say it wrong i mean with no country that sounds better you know what we're gonna put the we're gonna put the uh we'll inject the edit so you're gonna go i think the book is called and then we're gonna have just the me go, one? a man, a man with country. no country a man without a country there we go yeah so now Got you both. put them both in and we'll edit the, the right oh. one in um is that a good one should i read that 
It's it's a it's a fun musings about the decline of America. Oh boy, sounds really um, light. It's good. It's good. Um, that was a newly friend game. What do you think? Um, that was. I feel like I'm a better friend. Yeah, to you. we're newly friends. The challenge with us is we already were friends. Yeah. Um, for years, Josh. Years and years. Uh, and years and years and years and years. I have big years. Um, wow. Yeah, just part wow. of two. You should you should sell that to Obama. I I will. Um, I I have to ask. Uh, and this is not related to anything comedy wise, but I'm just so curious. Uh, when 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 the hair when the hair bleaching? Oh, when? that's funny. I filmed that special in yeah. April. I got back. Yeah. And just wanted to look different. I felt like I did the thing okay. that I've been working to for You're like the last. Shed the skin. Yeah, I was like, I've been working toward this for like six months. Yeah, planning the logistics, but also making sure my jokes were in tip-top shape. Mm. Which you probably tip, couldn't tell from listening to this podcast. I'd even tell jokes because I talked about <laughs> evangelical shit. For Listen, a while. this is steep conversations, not yeah. Stefani conversations. You could say wow. whatever you want. That's a phenomenal joke, Josh. You know, I gotta tell you, a different guest made it. I don't remember who it was. Mm. They said that exact joke. Uh, I think so. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, oh, you're reusing jokes. That's what I do. No. It's my podcast. I'm recycling. Yeah, yeah. yeah, But so I got back from the special taping. I made the decision that I'd been feeling for a while to cut off my commercial agent, who was a very nice person, but not really working for me, and also would call me on vacation and all these times where I'm like, they literally called me on my honeymoon, and they and I was like, I this was a while ago now. You're like I, I booked like, out. I was like, I, not only did I, I book. I book out every time I go out of town because I know the rules because I know what they need. But then she's calling me and again. She's a very nice person. So I know she's just trying to do her job. She's not, she doesn't make money. She doesn't make money unless I make money. I get it. Or her clients. But at the same time, I'm on my honeymoon. And I was like, Hey, I told you I'm booked out. I'm in, I'm in the middle of Montana at Glacier National Park. I don't want to do a self tape. I didn't bring the clothes for this self tape. I'm, I didn't do Probably didn't that. bring the camera for the self tape. No, I didn't do anything, right? I'm on my honeymoon. I'm trying to just hang out with my wife. And she literally goes, you know, a lot of my clients still still do self tapes on vacation. And I was like, this is not a vacation. This is my honeymoon. Like, I hate being that guy. I'm like, this is not the same. I get it. Yeah. If I want to get booked, I should probably freaking do self tapes on vacation. But a no. honeymoon is where I draw the line. Oh, I draw it at vacation. Yeah, yeah, I do usually draw it at vacation. So anyway, I dropped a commercial agent, and I had this freedom of, I don't got to look like my headshots anymore, at least for a while. Sure. I said, screw it. And I, I like that it was a hair dye and not not shave the mustache or grow a full no, beard. No, the mustache is fun for me. The hair, I did shave almost all the way. I don't know if you saw those photos. I did. But I was like nearly bald just for fun, and then and then dyed it a few weeks after that. Any of our balding listeners are going to hate that you said I was nearly bald for fun. You know how pe- that thing people hate. I did it for fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You're like, you're like, I never had fear I was gonna lose my hair, so I just decided to. Yeah, go yeah, for yeah. It. You know how some people hate eating trash out of a trash can. You did it. I did it for fun. You did. It. You're like, why not? Let's go for it. Yeah. I also love that your um honeymoon was at Glacier National Park. Yeah, it was really fun. Well, it was like right outside, right, and then we would go in. Yeah, I. It was a hot spring resort. It was sick. Oh, okay. That's there's different. a lot of hot spring resorts in Montana. I, because I don't want to, this is going to offend a lot of people. I know that. I don't really care all that honest. Um, okay. uh, don't love hiking. Oh, okay. Don't. Oh, you're going to say you don't love Montana. I'm like, there's not enough people in Montana to say a lot of people are not oh, going to like this. Oh, I know. I have, I have no beef with Montana. Um, I love Montana. I, I, love, I love Hank Green. I, uh, are the Greens from Montana? No, they're from Indiana, actually. Oh. But they grew up really close to me. Um, I had a high school teacher who was friends with them. But. Uh, this is what I meant about the loyalty and spirit of Indiana. I love Indiana. No, I do. In, if if I meet Indiana, from Indiana, I'll talk. I'll talk about Indiana. Yeah, all day. In, Indianians. I don't know. Indianans, or we go by Hoosiers. Hoosiers, which, which kind of sucks because I went to Purdue, which is rival with IU. Sure, Hoosier is the official title, but oftentimes people refer to the whole state. Well, I'll say this: Hoosiers seem to be very like you own your own. So, right. like, if you're like, oh, oh, that person's from Indiana, we, yeah, we, we love we, it. Yeah, we 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 lay we lay ownership on that. I met with somebody yesterday who's the younger brother of a friend from Indiana, just because I like just to be like, hey, you're from Indiana, like I'm gonna help you out. Let's like, link just, it up. Just like, yeah, I I I love helping out Indiana, well, especially well, because I know how that feels. We have all these people out here, and no shade to people who grew up here or no. New York, but when you grew up in L.A. or New York, or you go to NYU or USC, which again, if you can, that's amazing. But for people who grew up in like middle America, who don't have that, who didn't even know they wanted to stand up till they're in their twenties or whatever, you feel like you're missing out on this massive network. Speaking from experience, right? I don't want to feel entitled to the network, but I'm now trying to say, how can I help others have the network that I 100% didn't have? 
Yeah, of course. I remember when we first met for coffee. This is such a funny little coincidence. I don't know if you remember this. I was wearing. We were talking about that conversation so much. I know. I love it. No, I, mean, I love we've it. We've met a few different times. No, but I know. The I know. First but time the first ever... time was very memorable for both of us. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, well, but I was just saying, I was wearing a Vardigan sweatshirt, which is from which, Indiana. Which major shout out to. I will happily give them a free. Yeah, shout no, out. They're... I love you, Vardigan. Yeah, Jared, who runs Vardigan, is a, also named Jared. But he is a legitimate. Like I've known him for a while. His numbers in my phone. Yeah. This is such a stupid question about your special, but I always wonder this. Did you think a lot about like what you wanted to wear? Were you like, I really want to like what looks good on my frame? What looks good in camera? What do I feel confident telling jokes in? Do you think about that? Mostly in terms of talking it through with my wife. Absolutely. Well, I have a partner always knows better than you. I have a few performance shirts that I wear when I'm like, I should probably wear more than a sweatshirt to this. And so I was just kind of thinking about like the three or four things that fit that in my mind. And I picked the shirt that's in it that i just showed you the from i mean i loved it i um it's a nice green corduroy shirt that's which is great yeah i often will do more of a new because i like wearing fun sneakers as you may recall yeah 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 but i will often wear like more of a neutral on top so like maybe like a gray a dark gray sweater a light gray sweater say again so people think about your shoes uh so i don't so there's not a clash oh okay if i'm wearing really loud shoes (laughs) yeah my feeling has always been you can only be loud on one half so if I've got a really busy top. I, that's a fun, just like overall premise to apply to other areas of life. Sure. Yeah. But I really believe that if I have like a really like exciting, like sweater, really busy sweater, I'll wear much quieter sneakers. If I'm, if I'm wearing a plain, you know, like a black sweater, I'll wear much louder sneakers. It's fun. One thing that makes my feet always loud is I wear size 15 shoes. And every now and then I go on stage and I legitimately see people pointing at my feet going, those are big feet. And it's, it kind of sucks because it really takes them out of the show. <laughs> I mean, it also probably sucks because half the sneakers you want to buy, they don't make in your size. Oh, most do not. Yeah, I found a few brands that I just buy from all the time now. Um, the, the shoes that make my feet look huge are Converse, right? Because Converse are already just such a narrow shoe. But it's also so long. It looks like a clown right. shoe. So, yeah, when I wear them, it, it legit looks like clown shoes. I used to work with um, youth in a Culver City, like nonprofit. And every now and then these the high schooler would just be like, your feet are huge. And then I think they're making a joke, but they're truly just observing. Yeah. No, no. I do think it's funny that you call, you're just like, I worked with youths. How old does it make us sound when you're like, I worked with youths? I know. I'm still in my 20s. And I'm like, I worked with youths. I work with the youths. <laughs> um, one more just special question. I, I just, We don't have to talk about this forever, but I am just curious on the special. When you were setting out to make it, was there a moment where you were like, I'm ready. Or were you, did you do this kind of thing? Cause I do this to myself a lot. Mm. I do the kind of thing where I'm like, I'm not fully ready, but if I set a date, I have to be ready. Yeah. I think I was more that mindset. Yeah. 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 I, when I set the date in November, I filmed it in April. When I set the date in November, I thought to myself, Give yourself okay, about five months, yeah. not a ton. Which is, yeah. Which is enough to like, cause it's it, for me, it's the logistics. It's, and it's the prep and it's also the, like the joke prep, but also the prep of the tour because I knew I wanted to do a lot of shows right before it sure. to make sure that I was on fire or, you know, as much on fire as, as, as myself can be. How humble. You're like on fire, but I mean like not really. I mean, Slightly. you know what I mean? Like, at, yeah. So Candle when it. I did yeah. that, when I set the date, I was like, okay, what are the two or three jokes now that aren't yet finished that I'm now going to set as my goal? to like get to a great place by then. Mm. And that was kind of a fun way to look at it. Cause now one of my all time favorite jokes, that's like probably my, I, my guess is it'll be the most popular joke on the special is one of those jokes. My TSA pre-check joke. I think it's one of my most mature, like from a joke structure standpoint, the punchlines are very solid and it's very like the density is there and not to brag, but just like, but it came from that. I had the idea last summer and then, when I set the date in November, I was like, that's one of the jokes I want to be on the album because I love the premise so much. So I really try to target like these next few months. Like I'm going to polish that joke and that joke. Yeah. And it was fun to like view it from that. And then, but I was like, otherwise too big to think of like saying this like totally new thing is going to be on it. Like that just felt like too wild at that point. I sometimes, if I have a really important show, I'll do a brand new joke just to, just to light it up. Just to see. And I, I got the advice, and I also did this, of do one joke that you're not sure if it'll be good, because you can always cut it, but also it keeps you on your toes. Hell yeah. So that was fun. I did a joke like that. and um, Did it go? It did enough that I'm keeping it, but it wasn't as good as the other ones. But I'm like, it's fun to just know. It's like it's like a one-minute thing. And I'm like, it's not as good as some of the other jokes, but it's enough, it got enough of a laugh that I'm like, I think I'll keep it, and it's fun. I'll say this. Have you even heard it? It's my favorite joke in the special. It won't be. If that is, I, I will retire. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Are you ready for the lightning round? Oh my gosh. Yeah. We still have lightning left. We've, we already had some thunder. Let's get some lightning. Ooh, that's good. The lightning round, it's five fast questions. They don't have to be fast answers. Okay. okay. Uh, so question one, what is a favorite ritual of yours? So mine is Ooh. brewing tea. What is a favorite ritual that you have? Communion. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, they give um, you a cracker. Yeah, yeah, wafers these days. Sorry, man. wafers. No, no, you're you're right. It should be a cracker. Not a we're, we're cheap. Yeah, not as substantive as a cracker. Um, I I am a big morning journaler. So really? I do like I do, morning pages. Yeah, I didn't get it from that or from from Artist Way, but I um which is where most people I think yep. get, get yep, morning that's pages. That's what from. I was referencing. Yep. But yeah, I've been doing it for a while and I just wake up with so much anxiety, existential mm. angst. Is this worth it? Am I good enough? That if I put those thoughts on paper, at the, I did it this morning. Yeah. If I if I put those thoughts on paper, these moments I can exist in a little bit more at ease. The tension doesn't necessarily go away, but I can like set the intention for how I want to approach that anxiety for the rest of the day. Uh, question two: What is a running bit you have with a friend or partner that makes you laugh? A new one with my wife that's very fun that I love is um recently she went skydiving or she was supposed to go skydiving it ended up getting canceled because the weather but she was very nervous about it and she acted like she kept being like if i die this week like you know i want you to be happy and she and at one point she was like you're you know i'll get married but like wait a few years you know and and then i was just like man you'd love her and I, like as if I heard he was like about to get married and it's just a fun so every time now we're like scared of something we're just like You'd love her. Yeah. You'd love her. Like, you'd love my next wife. Yeah. Uh, question three. What is an impression of one or both of your parents? And the worse the impression, the better. We don't want a good one here. We want a bad one. Man, that's tough, actually. Very. Because my, my parents well, are very, like, good, but Indiana and, like, stock. Sure. You know, um, in a lot of ways. Um, so but nothing feels like um, my dad, we always tell him to do to make tiktoks right as any kid probably encourages their parents love of like you'd be so good on he's retired it's like just start making like he gives all these like hacks to us and then whenever we're like you should make a tiktok about that hack that you think is a hack but it's like very cute like it's very sweet he's like i eat popcorn with a spoon you know stuff like that um which i actually do now too but is that a good but, should I be doing but, that? but he always do, it just helps keep the grease not on your fingers you know and so he was like he'll always just be like, but it's not a hack it's not a hack. And so now me and my siblings just say that all the time. It's not a hack. It's not a hack. I'm like, but you clearly think that you're, you know something other people do. <laughs> but clearly I didn't know the spoon. With the right, popcorn. right. It's What's your hack. dad's name? Uh, Jim. Jim. Shout out Jim. Jim, yeah. that's a good idea. It's a good, um, hack. It's I a good hope, hack. I hope, I hope Jim watched this because I'm like, Jim, I'm with you. I'm going to try it. I, yeah. I'm, don't let me down. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try it. I don't want to look silly with the spoon. But yeah, I'm yeah. It. I, I was hard to think of an impression because in my mind, like their voices just sound so normal, but I'm realizing that's just because I grew up in Indiana. Of course. You know, versus like a New Yorker, it's like so easy to be like, ah, this is my parents. Yeah. You know? Um, question four, and we started touching on this a little bit before we were recording. Um, have you ever experienced imposter syndrome? And if so, is there a particular moment that sticks with you? Dude, all the time. I, I experience it on most shows. I think that there's, there always seems to be at least one comic that I feel intimidated by on a lineup. And I've apologized for that, but there's nothing I can do. So. I, like, even when I taped my special, I, I was very specific about the comics that I asked to open because I want to make sure that I didn't at all feel intimidated by them. Not that I'm better than them, but just like they're friends, they're supportive. Sure. I know they're going to support versus there are other people, even in Indiana, that like were already doing the headlining bar show maybe level in the Midwest that I looked up to when I started and almost that entire class I'm still like intimidated by even though I also often headline some of those bar shows you sure. know what I mean although a lot of those guys are now past that too um last question what is your favorite tea or comfort and I know you're not a big tea drinker so what is your favorite comfort? I drink some tea um like I said if you know we we listen to the podcast I will teach you to be rich by Ramit Sethi do you know that podcast no. just got a Netflix show the the name is a very much a misnomer and so it's more about how to psychologically understand finances rather than actually, it's not like hacking to be rich. To it's more like if you're, yeah, it, it's more like if you, like how, no matter how much money you have, how to have the right mindset about it. It's very psychological. He's like a trained psychologist and then also like finances. So it's very interesting. Anyway, I just always have to say that when I mention the podcast because it, it sounds like a, a like growth hack mm. shitty type thing and it's not. It's just a very provocative title. But he always talks about, you know, like, what is your rich life? Like, what would it, what, if you could be richer, 
what are the luxuries you would want? And then how do we, in small ways, no matter how much money you make, like incorporate that into your current life by maybe sacrificing other things to like occasionally have this luxury, right? It's like an exercise. And we all, I, for me, my rich life would be endless craft coffee. Mm. Like truly, like I don't want to have to worry about coffee bean prices, which I do. Mm-hmm. And then I want a sauna in my house. So your favorite comforts. I craft love a coffee sauna. And a sauna. I love it. Um, how do you feel about this podcast? Feel good? I feel good. I feel like I wasn't nearly funny enough. I only made the producer laugh three, four times. I, which is more than he laughs at me. That's so good. that's, that's something. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we are also going to drop the link to your special in the description. Sure. Um, that'd be great. Whenever that becomes uh, the, for a date, the better Jared. Thank you. I'm the better right Jared. Get ready for it. The better Jared. The better Jared dropping fall of 2023. I hope it does well. If not, we keep going because if, it yeah. doesn't really matter. If and not, we, and we, we get another job. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> if not, you and I will become baristas together. Um, yeah, we could. Yeah. Thank you for coming, buddy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That was Jared Kassebaum. You can catch his special, The Better Jared, on YouTube starting October 4th. You can also catch him at Cast the Bomb on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. Steep Conversations is produced and edited by Elliot GB. Our associate editor is Martin Alvarez. Our theme song and additional music are by Oliver Hymack. Our cover art was done by Neil Fraser with photography by Matt Mazisco. Social media by Dia Villegas. Please write a review and rate our podcast on Apple Podcasts and wherever else you can. You can send any questions, comments, newly friend game suggestions, or tea suggestions to steepcombos at gmail.com or tweet us at steepcombos. I'm Josh Lanzette, and you can follow me on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook at Josh Lanzette. We'll be back next week. So until then, happy steeping. Well, I mean, M. Night Shyamalan's best work, in my opinion, was an uncredited rewrite on Cheese All That. Although you want better. Did you know you wrote Stuart Little? I did. Okay, dang yes, it. Yes, I did. I did. I did. And I got to tell you, great work. Yeah, oh, Stuart Little is, is a masterpiece. Yeah, Wonderful. Stuart Little 2, pretty bad. Uh, I Little. didn't see Stuart Little 2. It's, uh, it's he, no Paddington 2. Oh, no. Paddington 2 is the I sequel say, of I've all sequels. I've never seen it, and I've heard that Paddington 2 oh, is really? a masterpiece. Oh, it's so good.